like to welcome you back to our study on Zechariah the prophet. Today we're going to be continuing with chapter 9. Uh, if you remember from chapters 7 and chapters 8, in chapter 7, uh, God's people sent a delegation of people to the priests, to the prophets, to ask about the ritual fasting days they had, the traditional fasting days they had throughout the year. And uh, in, of course, the latter part of chapter 7 and the better part of chapter 8, God responds to their question about fasting and proceeds to tell them that the reality is it's not just about keeping the law or keeping traditions per se, no matter if they're good or not. Uh, we can have lots of good traditions that we want uh, that we want to preserve because they're good for our family. They're good for you know holding us together as a people. But those traditions become very meaningless if there's not a good spirit. In, in, in the heart of it. And that's what it was all about to God. He wanted them to come together with the right spirit. And then their traditions became meaningful. Today we're going to continue into chapter 9. Again, as we've been going through this, I've been talking about the fact that a lot of these prophecies uh, pertained to the time of Zechariah and the house of Israel while they were in Babylon and about to leave Babylon. Today we're going to see a small piece of a prophecy, a very famous one, uh, that of course is quoted in the New Testament and we always use at Christmas time. But as we read through this and take the whole prophecy into its context, all of a sudden it gives us a different picture. That isn't to say that the partial and I would say partial fulfillment uh, at Christ's first coming, uh, isn't true. But what it means is that there may be a more fuller completion in the near future, maybe even in Christ's second coming. So let's get into Zechariah chapter 9 and see where it takes us today. I suspect much of what we're going to read, again, just like we've been doing, is speaking about prophecy today right before Christ's uh, second coming. Uh, we'll be discussing certain different aspects of this, but uh, the reality of it is, a as with all prophecy, we can give warnings, we can read these passages, understand the warnings, understand the causes and the effects, which is actually the, the, the most important piece in this, watching the patterns, because it's hard for us to point down and say, okay, this prophecy was fulfilled on this date or this prophecy will be fulfilled on this date. We can see how things roll and we can make those assumptions. But anybody who's went to any church will find that, you know, you get 10 people together who love studying the scriptures and probably all 10 of them will have a different perspective on something. And that's good. That's okay. That's not a problem. But our purpose is to begin watching historically the causes and effects, the patterns. What is it that causes this thing to happen? And as we watch those things, all of a sudden we can bring them forward to our time and say, okay, this is what happened back then. Uh, this is what it caused to happen. You know, God's people did this. God responded this way. As we see those patterns and we bring them forward to our time, then it gets to where it's much easier to say, okay, we're doing the same thing. Uh, word for word, action for action. We're, we're following what they did. So we must assume if we believe we are God's people, true Christians, then God's going to respond this way. And that's what this is all about as we study this history and, and study these prophecies. It's putting those pieces together and then attempting to compare potential time frames when these things could fit. But knowing that when it's all said and done, when we stand before God, that's when we'll probably know for sure one way or the other. The important thing, though, is to look for those patterns and prepare our own life. Because obviously, if we're following Israel or Jerusalem in their bad patterns, we can assume whatever it was God did to chastise them, we're probably looking at receiving that. And that's probably not what we want. So the idea is avoid the bad patterns and follow the good patterns. Those are what actually give us life and hope. So 
Zechariah chapter 9, let's start out, we're in verses 1 through 5. And the burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach and Damascus shall be the rest thereof, where when the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be towards the Lord. And Hamath, Hamath also shall border thereby, Tyrus and Sidon, though it be very wise. And Tyrus did build herself a stronghold and heap up silver as the dust and fine gold as the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out and he will smite her power in the sea and she shall be devoured with fire. Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. Ekron for her expectations shall be ashamed and the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. So we have a prophecy over several small country uh, city-states that are around Israel, and we'll be looking at a map in a second to kind of get an idea where some of these are, where some of these are. But one of the important things I just want to point out in that verse 1, it's focusing here, it's saying, when the eyes of man shall be towards the Lord. So this isn't just any period of time. This is a moment when likely, the way this is phrased, it's speaking universally the world over, for the most part, in, in, in generalities, the world over is looking towards God with a certain amount of expectation. So when this time comes and the world is looking to God it, with a certain amount of expectation, good or bad, uh, there's some events going to happen in here in these towns. Now, whether it's specifically in these towns or not, that's, you know, that way that we'll have to wait and see on that. But there's a very strong possibility that there's a parallel to this. If we look at where these cities are, we may find that there's a parallel to this elsewhere. Again, when we're, we're focusing in on Israel, which was the important of God's prophecies, he's talking to the people in Babylon who are about to go back and rebuild. And so, you know, these, th these are things they would have understood to a degree. They know where these places are. Uh, they, some of them may have even visited them, their great-grandfathers, before they went into captivity in Babylon. May have actually visited them. If they were traders, may have went there regularly. And so they're seeing these, and God's saying, there's a certain amount of people, there's a certain amount of these places that are going to be destroyed. Let's continue. Uh, here we can see the map. We can see where Israel is located. And, of course, I've got four circles there on the coastline. Uh, uh, the, one, the first two, Sidon and Tyre, are up in Lebanon uh, at this point in history. Ashkelon is actually in Israel. And, of course, Ga Gaza is down in the Palestinian state of Gaza. And so we can see that all of those are along the coast, which is interesting. Why the coastal cities? You know, when Babylon came in, uh, did they come down the coast? Were the coastal cities the most important? Uh, of course, remember, we're at the point here where Israel's about to return from Babylon and rebuild. Who comes after Israel, uh, after Babylon? Of course, we know the Medes and the Persians do. And then after the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and then uh, the Roman Empire. How do these coastal cities play into that? And why is it on the coastal cities? And it's just an interesting thing. As I was reading through this, I was thinking about one of the prophecies that we have in the church that goes back all the way into 1864-65, uh, when one of our apostles, Granville Hedrick, had this revelation. And I just want to I just took out an excerpt from his uh, prophecy that I wanted to read here. And of course, this was specifically speaking about the United States. It says, For thus it shall be unto your country. It shall be attacked by a mighty foe on the south and east, by a combination of strong nations, and the eastern cities of the great Atlantic Ocean will be blockaded by a combination feet, fleet upon the coast. And all vessels of the federal government upon the high seas will be endangered. Woe, woe to the proud cities of the east. For their railroads will be tore up, and poverty and misery pervade the land. And so this prophecy that he saw, which was speaking about the United States, again, focuses on the proud cities of the coast. And I think 
that's probably the, the bulk of the importance of this prophecy, even in Zechariah. God's focusing in. Of course, coastal cities often have a lot of trade. You have a lot of ships coming in and out. Coastal cities, uh, especially those with docks and whatnot, tend to be really blessed. A lot of fishing, a lot of import exports, etc., etc. And so they tend to be very prosperous. And so, you know, as he's focusing in this prophecy of Granville Hedricks, the focus here isn't so much the, the, the coastal city as it is the proud cities. You know, they've been rich, uh, enriched by their trade and their marketing. And so now they don't need God. They don't need uh, the things of God because now they can solve all their problems with money, with whatever they're bringing in, imports and exports, and they just don't need God. And I think that's really the importance of this. We're coming into a time when, like these coastal cities, we may be so rich that we just don't feel like we need God. And it's at that moment that we have our most dangerous time because when we get so proud that we don't think we need God, it's probably the moment like this prophecy, when God's going to step in and do some damage. Call us back to him. Verse 6 through 8 in Zechariah. And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines, and I will take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. But he that remaineth, even he shall be for our God, and he shall be as a governor in Judah and Ekron as a Jebusite. Wow, you know, th this just threw off the whole thing. We have these coastal cities. Now, we know where these are in Israel. We know from the time that the Israelites, the, the Jews, returned from Babylon and rebuilt. From that time till today, those coastal cities really have not been coastal cities for God. You know, it talks about a destruction here. Well, there's been a lot of wars and, and, and whatnot in those areas, a lot of bloodshed. It would be hard to point to any one of those wars and say, well, this was it. But in 7, it gives us this piece that really rules out the bulk of every, every one of those wars. Now, it's not to say that I have a perfect understanding of all history. You know, we don't even have perhaps all of history written for us what has happened. But what it's telling us is these proud cities along the coast, when they have this destruction, there's a moment when they will turn their eyes to God, the real God. And that's pretty extraordinary. And, and I'm assuming, based on my own studies of history, that this probably has not happened yet but that this is before us and probably going to happen soon. Again, as we get you know, closer and closer to chapter 14, in chapter 14, there's a little bit of uh, a war that breaks out, and a lot of things happen, and we'll get into that in, uh, soon enough. But I suspect that what's happening there is what this is talking about. The results of that is going to leave a remnant in these coastal cities that will search out God. And I suspect that maybe from Granville Hedrick's dream, there's something similar going to be playing out as those cities uh, are chastised by God, that those that remain also will begin looking towards God. Uh, verse 8, and it says, And I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passes by, and because of him that returneth, and no oppressor shall pass through them any more. For now I have seen with mine eyes. And this is pretty important. And so this enemy that's coming in, God's protecting his people. That doesn't mean he's protecting Israel per se, but prophetically he's protecting his people, those people who not just are following the law, but those people who are following the spirit of the law also. And that's, that's vitally important. These are his house. This is what he's been building with. Um, but there's an army, he speaks of, that passes by, but he will protect his people. He says, no oppressors will pass through them anymore. That, that's a pretty big promise to be putting in, and, and I'm guessing that this promise probably can only mean something in the future. Because, of course, if we go back into the Middle East, we know that, like I said, after Babylon came the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and then the Roman Empire, which literally destroyed Israel, uh, Jerusalem and everyone there. There were uh, legally, by Roman laws, not allowed, for the most part, uh, Jews and Christians to be in Jerusalem. They were all scattered. 
uh, in the four winds. And so that's probably not anything that's been fulfilled yet from that time forward. But what it says is that one day no oppressor shall pass through them anymore. So we've got a period here when God is changing these people, changing their hearts, and that's a pretty remarkable thing. Verse 9 uh, into verse 12. And of course, this is really what I was talking about in the beginning, that piece of prophecy that jumps into Christ's first coming. Remember, we've just talked about coastal cities. We've talked about a destruction in those coastal cities, a destruction that causes whoever is left to turn to God. Now, did any of that happen before Christ's first coming? No. So, now let's go into verse 9 through 12 and see what it tells us here. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariots of Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have set forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope, even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Very important. And so we've got this prophecy in verse 9, a prophecy that we see fulfilled to a degree in uh, Christ's first coming when he's coming into Jerusalem to be crucified. Thy king cometh on an ass, on, the colt, uh, on a colt, the foal of an ass, and he's having salvation with him. And so he comes in, and of course we know uh, anybody who, uh, who's read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus comes in. Uh, he goes before Pontius Pilate. He is eventually scourged and sent to be crucified. And, of course, we know that through his crucifixion, and even more importantly, through his resurrection, we have a hope for salvation. And that's, of course, what this is all about, really. Verse 12, it tells us to turn to that stronghold. There's no physical stronghold in this world that can protect us like he can. We're prisoners of hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, and that is what we never can lose. When we lose that hope, we don't have anything because we can build castles here. We can build fortresses here. We can arm those fortresses with cannons and who knows what not. But the reality is there's always going to be someone on the block bigger than us, and they're going to come in and they're going to walk all over us. Yet when our hope is in Jesus Christ, no one is bigger than him. And that's important. So, how can we know that this prophecy isn't entirely fulfilled in Christ's first coming? Well, part of that's in verse 10. And that's important also. I will cut off the chariots of Ephraim. Now, who is Ephraim? And this is important to think about. Because if he's going to cut off the chariots of Ephraim, then we have to know who Ephraim was. And so... It, here we've got a small map. You can see kind of the, the uh, skin-toned pinkish area there, peach area. This is the Assyrian army, the Assyrian area that they conquested all the way back in 734, 732, uh, the 9th century BC. They came in and they destroyed Ephraim. What was Ephraim? Ephraim was the ten tribes to the north. If we remember in uh, Solomon's son's era, when Solomon died and his son came into power, he came in, gathered the, the heads of all the tribes and says, you know, my father was a rough guy. He was a, 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 a strong handed uh, ruler. I'm going to be much more strong. I'm going to be much worse. I'm going to scourge you guys uh, like you've never had before. And of course, all the heads came together. They talked about it and decided, no, that's probably not going to happen. So 10 tribes split off to the north and two tribes split to the south. And we had the, the, the first two kings under that split re uh, reign, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And so the 10 tribes to the north were from that point forward typically referred to as either Ephraim, the combination of those 10 tribes, or Israel. 
the lower two tribes, and, and there were more than just the two tribes in the lower part, but it focused uh, on the fir- on the lower two tribes, which was Judah and Benjamin. There were a few other, uh, obviously there were priests from Levi uh, there also, but technically it's thought of as they were just the two tribes in the lower part. So uh, Assyria came in. And this is the passage we have up here, 1 Chronicles 5, 25 and 26. And they transgressed against the God of their fathers and went a whoring after the gods of the people of the land, whom God destroyed before them. And the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, and the spirit of Tilgathpilneser, king of Assyria. And he carried them away. Even the Reubenites the, and the Gadites and half the uh, tribe of Manasseh and brought them to Halath uh, and Harer and Hara and to the river Gosen unto this day. And so they came in. The Assyrian kings came and destroyed Ephraim, Israel, and left only the southern two tribes, that area occup- occupied by Judah and Benjamin. So why is this important? Well, this happened prior to Babylon coming in and attacking Jerusalem. So at the point at which Zechariah is prophesying, this is already old news by, by, by 100 to 200 years. This is nothing new. Uh, so how is Christ coming in, sitting on uh, the colt on the full of an ass, tying with the destruction of Ephraim, which happened 100 plus years in the past? Almost 200 years at this point of Zachariah's prophecy. How does those fit together? Well, we know that they can't fit together. Uh, Christ didn't come till around, you know, zero, uh, around the era of zero. And what happened here was back in the, the ninth century, 734 uh, B.C. Uh, entirely different eras of time. And so that's what gives us understanding that this prophecy even though we're reading the words and some of it we know where it was uh, fulfilled, has a different focus. When was Ephraim ever restored? Now, that's actually a better question. And we know Old Testament, New Testament, Ephraim never was restored. So there has to be this period of time much later when what is referred to as Israel And the word Israel typically referred to all of the tribes or the bulk of the tribes. And so there has to be this point in the future when, again, Israel as a nation is going to be uh, known of. They're going to rebuild and they're no longer going to be known as only Jews, but they're going to be known as Israel, the name that speaks of potentially all the tribes. And that's important because that's the moment when the second part of this prophecy is going to be happening, when the king cometh and he's bringing salvation. So essentially we have three principal time periods that we can consider as we're reading this passage in the time of Zechariah. The first is the first coming of Christ or the second coming of Christ. As we see in the passage, it refers to Ephraim or in other words, the 10 northern tribes. In Zechariah's time, they were already gone During Christ's first coming, they didn't exist. This only leaves a period of Christ's second coming as a realistic option. So there must be a second potential fulfillment of this prophecy. And it doesn't necessarily mean that Christ's going to come in on a donkey again. He may, just like he did then, or it may be symbolic, metaphorical. But what we know is Christ is coming again, and he's coming humbly. Uh, That was the point of coming in on the donkeys, coming humbly, but he's coming with salvation. And that's what we're hoping for. Let's continue in Zechariah. We're in verses 13 through 15. When I have bent Judah for me, and of course, think about his first coming. Did he really bend Judah for him? It says, filled the bow with Ephraim. Of course, Ephraim didn't exist in his first coming. So we have this problem, this conflict in the prophecy. And raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. And so there's a moment in here when God's raising up his people, the house of Israel, and they're coming against what is symbolically Greece. 
That's an important thing. Now, we know that because Zechariah is prophesying in the time of the Babylonian uh, conquest, we have the Medes and the Persian that comes after this, and then Greece. So we still have a while before Greece actually comes into this picture. And Israel was not the country that broke Greece at all. Uh, they were actually dominated by Greece. And then the Romans came in and dominated them. So this can't be pertaining to that period of time. During that time, of course, we know Alexander the Great came in. He was the, the, the mover and shaker in Greece uh, that allowed them to conquer all of what is Syria, all that is Israel, all that is Babylon, and well over into the east. Uh, and it wasn't until he died uh, after you know getting probably a little too drunk, as that's kind of what uh, history uh, says, whether it's true or not. We don't exactly know he died. He could have been poisoned, who knows. But he died a young man, and his conquest ended, and Israel didn't actually have much to do with it. So this is important as we're looking at this. So there must be another fulfillment. When God brings together Judah, Ephraim, the house of Israel, and raises them up, Verse 14, and the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south, and the Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with slings, stones, and they shall drink and make noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bulls and as the corners of the altar. And so God is with his people, and there is this spirit of, of power, joy, and uh, fullness that is with his people. And, of course, again, historically, we don't have any words that we can pinpoint and say this is when this happened. So we have to assume, again, that there is some of this in the near future when Christ returns again. Verse 16 and 17, And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. Very important because we have the same wording for this in chapter 14. Uh, and again, we haven't got there, but if you've read through it already, you know what I'm talking about. It, it, it tells us in chapter 14 that God comes to save his people. That's what this is about. And so God again comes to save his people. As we talked about in previous chapters, God isn't calling us as a people to arms. He will come. He will save his people as the flock of his people. Think about, you know, wolves coming and surrounding sheep. It's not the sheep that do the fighting for the most part. It's the shepherd that fights for the sheep. And that's what we're talking about. Christ coming, him standing up, him being the Savior, and we looking to him as that Savior. And his people, it says, will be as the stones of a crown. And so what we're really talking about there, and there's several passages in, in the Scripture that bring this in and talk about God's people as precious stones. And, of course, this is speaking about the distinction uh, throughout the world of God's people. Every nation, every country, we're distinct in who and what we are. But... As we follow Christ's commandment, we become these perfect stones, purified by God, not by ourselves, purified by God. And we look, uh, our image is this beautiful stone, diamonds, emeralds, rubies, whatever it is, we're these beautiful stones that God has purified. And we look wonderful. And at this point in 16, of course, he says, we will be lifted up as an ensign, which means it's kind of like a flag, uh, you know, a meet point where the world will see it and say, OK, this is this is what we want. And of course, we have in Isaiah 2, it tells us uh, the other piece to this. And it tells us nations, great nations of the world will come up to the mountain of the Lord and say, let us go up to learn of his laws and of his ways. And that's what this is about. The ensign is set up, not because we came out as mighty warriors, but because we came out as saints. And that's the real key. When we come out as saints and become truly God's people, then we become this ensign. Verse 17, for how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty 
Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. And so God's people are robust and beautiful, not actually because of alcohol, but because of the spirit that is in them. It's this comparison that oftentimes we'll find in Scripture between spirit and spirit. And, and there's some similarity to it in some ways. Obviously, a person who drinks becomes uh, uh, kind of rosy in complexion. Uh, apart from that, a lot of people who drink say that they drink because it allows them to come out and actually begin to socialize. They feel like they're socially inept without drinking. They feel like they can't really get out and make friends without having that drink. Well, you know, there's, there's a parallel. I hate to make this comparison because obviously I don't believe that we should be drinking at all, and I don't want to justify it. I also don't want to diminish at all what the Spirit does. But this is what I have experienced in my own life. When God's Spirit is with us, it allows us to do things that we would never imagine doing ourselves. It allows us to go and talk to people and share the gospel uh, when when we would never do it, you know, maybe because of our embarrassment, uh, maybe we're introverts, maybe, you know, we're just not the kind of people that get out and socialize. Maybe we're even embarrassed about the gospel. Uh, we wouldn't do it on our own, but by the power of that spirit, we step out and we share the good news. We share the gospel. We share the joy that God has brought into our life. It happens in your places of work. It happens, you know, even when we're in the grocery store, someone comes up and begins talking to us, a complete stranger off the road. Something they said uh, provokes something in us, and we start sharing this wonderful testimony of something God's done in our life. And when it's all said and done and we're at home thinking about it, it's like, wow, how did I just do that? Why did I just do that? I just shared a very intimate testimony in my life with a complete stranger. Just isn't normal. And that's what this is talking about, that comparison with spirits and spirits. And when we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, it allows us to do a great many things. It allows us to have strength that we do not have personally. And, of course, God, what God is saying is we can we can do many great things in this world without the chemicals that we ourselves make to do those same things things. You know, we make alcohol to give us the ability to socialize, but God's saying with his spirit, we don't need those things that we make, lesser things that actually have very negative side effects, because there really isn't a negative side effect to the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's no, you know, hangover. There's no bad side of it that impairs our ability to drive or fly or whatever. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives us vision, strength, and ability that actually makes us much safer people, better people, uh, more capable of dealing with the problems that exist in this world. You know, a lot of times we resort to the spirits of this world to forget our misery and sadness. Yet with the Holy Spirit, he gives us the power to conquer the difficulties in our life. And so it's such an amazing difference. Uh, and that's probably the only reason I, I connect this in here, uh, because when we become this people of God, these jewels, it will not be because we're drinking alcohol. It will be because our heart is filled with this Holy Spirit. And that is probably the most important thing that we need today. We need that Holy Spirit. We need to have that connection with God. We need, you know, to get it. One of the first things the scriptures tells us is that God's spirit cannot dwell in an unholy temple. And so if you think of yourself as a building and inside of this building is where the Holy Spirit is going to reside, the first part is to clean up the building. And of course, this means we have to quit things like alcohol, tobacco, drugs, etc., etc., things that impair our ability to do things right. We've got to clean the building and not just of those things uh swearing cussing bad language bad thoughts what we're looking at what we're occupying our time in uh all the the things of the world that have no meaning no substance and no real point we need to clean our house then the holy spirit can have us a, a, a solid residence you know you think about 
when it says the Holy Spirit can't dwell in unholy temples. And so you think about it. Let's say we take today and we repent of all of our sins. We clean up our house, you know, kind of like the spring cleaning we like to do for our physical houses. Okay. And so the Holy Spirit looks and says, yay, you really cleaned up. This is awesome. And he moves in. But if we don't keep it clean, he's not going to stay there. And it's kind of pointless if we want a spirit-filled life to do a once-a-year spring cleaning. That's not the right way to live as Christians. The right way to live is to keep the house clean. So, yes, we need to do that spring cleaning. We need to repent. We need to come to God. We need to invite the Holy Spirit in. And, of course, follow God's commandments. If we haven't been baptized, look at making that covenant with God because that's what it's about. It's about making a covenant with God. We want to be part of him. So we make that covenant. He gives us the first part of our inheritance, which is the Holy Spirit. And now we need to maintain this house. When we maintain this house clean, then we have that, that connection with the Holy Spirit that allows the Holy Spirit on a constant basis to communicate with us, to give us wisdom, to give us understanding, to give us direction, to guide us in, in everything that we're doing. But if we dirty up this house, then the Holy Spirit is forced to vacate until we clean it up again. And so the important thing here is not just to clean it up once in a while, but to maintain it clean. Let's clean up our houses. Let's get the Holy Spirit working in us with power and might, and let's become these jewels that God's looking for. That will be the end sign, uh, the focus, the flag that calls the world in to a better way of life. Thank you. Hope that this helps you and inspires your day somewhat. God bless.